السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. My name is Adil Abdel Ghaffar. I'm a fellow at the Brookings Doha Center. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event uh, on politics in the Maghreb. Before we start, I would like to make a uh, geographical uh, clarification. Historically, the Greater Maghreb region has included Algeria, Morocco, and Tunis, and Libya. We have purposely not included Libya, but we are aiming to have a specific Libya event that will deal with its ongoing challenges in its transition. So tonight, we are focusing on Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia. I've had the pleasure of actually traveling to all three countries over the past number of years. And I'm struck by the similarities and some of the differences as well that I've seen in the three countries. I would like to make two key observations first. First, I'm often struck by the vibrancy and the ongoing transformation that the Maghreb region is undergoing with the region's youth at the forefront of this transformation. 40%, more than 40% of the population is under 25. Like other parts of the Arab world, these youth would be key to the region's stability or instability. This generation has come out of age, come of age during an unprecedented digital revolution. They have witnessed the spread of globalization, and participated in a historic wave of protests. They are also the region's best educated and most urbanized generation. And thanks to the internet and social media, highly connected to the rest of the world. Despite all of this, this generation is also the least employed, with youth unemployment rates going up to 30% and even 40% in certain rural areas. Increased marginalization, decreased economic opportunities, and the lack of political openness has on occasion led to social unrest, legal and illegal migration, brain drain, and worst of all, provided a pathway to radicalization and violence. The second observation I would like to make is that governments in the region and ruling elites are under double pressure. On one hand, they have pressure, economic pressures from overstretched state finances, inefficient bureaucracies, lower oil prices in the case of Algeria, and pressure from international financial institutions. On the other hand, these governments face pressures from their own people, from their own populations who, after 2010 and 2011, have had their aspirations rise very high, but until now, these aspirations have not been fulfilled. And these unfulfilled aspirations have led to frustrations. So these are the type of pressures that these governments are facing. So tonight's panel, we're focusing on change and continuity. So with our esteemed audience, we will focus on what has changed and what hasn't. We also want to look at some of the similarities across the, th the three countries, but also some of the differences. So to answer some of these questions and to grapple with some of these issues, we have assembled for you a fantastic panel of experts. Immediately to my left, Professor Maati Munjib is a political analyst and a historian at the University of Muhammad V in Rabat. He is a founding member of the 20th February movement, which led the Arab uprisings in Morocco. Professor Munjib is also a leading human rights defender, not only in Morocco, but across the region, which has gotten him in trouble with the authorities on occasion. His most recent book is titled The Nationalist Movement in Northern Morocco. To his left, we have Dr. Amal Boubakr, who researches at the Grenoble University Pierre Mendes in Grenoble and is a research associate at the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies. 
Her research focuses on Maghreb country politics, democratization in the Arab world, Euro, Arab, and US relations, and Islam in Europe. Amongst her many publications, she is the co-editor of Whatever Happened to the Islamists. And most importantly, Dr. Amal is a previous colleague of the Brookings Doha Center, and it's always a pleasure to welcome her back. Last but not least, Professor Arabi Sadiqi, who is my colleague, mentor, and all-round general inspiration to this generation of uh, scholars. Uh, Professor Arabi insisted not to use a lengthy bio, but wanted to be introduced as simply a student of Arab democratic transitions. <laughs> Professor Arabi is currently at the Qatar University, where he specializes in Arab democratization. He is the editor of the Routledge series, Studies in Middle Eastern Democratization and Government. So, ladies and gentlemen, today we will organize the panel as follows. We will have 10 minutes uh, opening comments for each of our panelists. Uh, then we'll follow by a discussion. And in the end, we'll have a Q&A for the audience uh, to interact with our guests. Uh, we have had a bit of discussion who should start. And then we decided in the end with the, the biggest population and alphabetically as well, we will start with Algeria. So please, Dr. Amos. Thank you. When we talk about Algeria, we always wondering what kind of change is going to happen, if any. If you remember, in 2014, fourth mandate of President Bouteflika, current president, uh, re-elected for a fourth mandate. Before the elections, everybody was wondering what was going to happen. We are a year ahead of the next presidential election. Mm -hmm. And in Algeria, presidential circles are already talking about a fifth mandate. Mm -hmm. What is going to happen in Algeria? That's the question that everybody is always asking me. Are we going to see the re-election of Bouteflika? Most probably. Is it interesting? Is it important? Yes. Are we going to see an authoritarian resilience? Or is the country on the verge of, the re of a revolution? Well, the truth is nobody knows what is going to happen. Because the power, as it, it is called in Algeria, and civil society are all waiting for change, but they don't know how, and they don't know with, with which tools. Algeria is an interesting country, and it's an interesting case study, because it is uh, forcing us to get rid of the usual transitology approach. You know, we have a revolution, or a crisis, then the old elite uh, makes its comeback on the political scene, and then it's business as usual. Well, I would say that in Algeria, we are much more in a, politic of, a politics of waiting. Uh, we are very much exper experiencing politics of waiting. People are really waiting for a change. Mm. They don't know when it's going to come, or to be, when it's going to happen. Uh, but they, are, they have the feeling that something is going to happen, but in the meantime, they are live, trying to live as usual and pretending that in Algeria you can do politics. I would say that Algeria forces us to think in a new way or in a different way that this transitology approach that I was mentioning by not considering the power state institutions, state elites has a coherent block on one hand and civil society as a coherent bloc, on the other hand, conflicting with it or opposing each other uh, for uh, the control of resources, institutions. It's much more an interaction of, po of people, of opportunities, and it's interesting to see what these uh, politics of waiting produce. And I believe it's interesting for the whole region because Algeria has experimenting has experimented uh, this 1992 uh, coup d'etat, you know the story, a kind of failed revolution uh, in 1988, even before, and several failed uh, protests and, and, and demands for change. But what is most interesting is that, okay, there has been a survival of this regime and of the tools that have helped 
DOE to stay in, stay in place can be considered as uh, re tools that, has, are, that are derived from uh, the, the usual and classical uh, neo-authoritarian governance. It means that you can uh, make your return on the political scene. But these tools, more specifically now, are threatening the regime from the inside. And they have also created new culture of opposition. So that's why I think Algeria is an interesting country for the whole region, because in Tunisia, the revolution, the old elite made its comeback, and things have changed, but uh, I, we don't know in which direction. Same thing in Morocco. So that's why I'm going to talk about uh, today how actually this blocked politics in Algeria have created what I believe the two most interesting challenges for the region. First, the need to reinvent institutions and structures that will be post-presidential or post-civilian facade because you know that in Algeria, Bouteflika is incarnating this presidential facade and he's incarnating the way Algeria has been able to get out of the, the civil war crisis. So the, how, what can tools can be reinvented after Bouteflika, political tools of negotiation? And the second important challenge is about new culture of civil resistance. We have protests every day in Algeria, but no revolution. That doesn't mean that they have, as I said in the introduction, that we are not witnessing change, but we actually have protests, street protests, daily street protests, who are using protests, riots, uh, demonstrations, not to get rid of the regime, but to negotiate with him and, uh, and with, with the regime. And I will explain how. So first of all, a bit of context. You know that in 1990, Algeria uh, witnessed his first, its first president, civilian president, Bouteflika, was brought by the army as the miracle actor of a new democratic area in, in Algeria. Uh, he was the perfect cast, actually. He was able, because he was not a member of the military, and certainly not a member of the, uh, the general uh, collegial uh, uh, members uh, of, of army uh, generals uh, who have been implicated or who have been, who have been uh, deciding uh, about the interruption of the, of the electoral process in 1992. Mm -hmm. So Boutfika was this perfect cast, this perfect civilian president, and actually he became a nipper presidential president, a super powerful president. So that was good because Algerians thought, okay, we get rid of the army, we are no more uh, uh, under the, the, the grip of, of the army. Uh, the international actors also welcomed Bouteflika as a civilian actor, but it created uh, um, several obstacles. Uh, first, this hyper-presidential function, this super powerful president has uh, sidelined every kind of state institutions that Algeria have uh, preserved since the civil war. Governance was mainly by decrees, by presidential decrees. Uh, opposition parties have been co-opted within a presidential alliance, even an Islamist one. Uh, the army wasn't that much in the front, and that was actually something that the army wanted very much so after the civil war, was not uh, uh, in the forehead of, of, uh, of government decisions. So everything seemed to be perfect, but the problem now is there's a huge succession crisis because who can succeed to a super powerful president like Bouteflika? Mm. Any competitor have been sidelined. Uh, opposition parties also are not that much willing to play the game of the cooptation politics after four and a potential fifth mandate. It was okay to them to be integrated, uh, co-opted by, by, by the president in order to give an impression and a feeling of pluralism in the f first, second, third mandate, but fourth and fifth mandate, it's difficult to them to play a real role, even to be taken seriously by uh, even their grassroots, uh, because gra political uh, parties, grassroots, and even ordinary citizens know that election is not the place of change in Algeria. They know that elections are very
very much controlled from the top and that it's not through elections that they are going to change their relationship with institutions or have a greater part uh, to uh, or, or, or a greater political say uh, uh, in, in the country. Mm. Um, so succession crisis, very important in element. Uh, the blocking of any uh, even internal uh, competitor in the regime because you know that's how it went. Uh, the army will pick up someone from its circles and that will do. Now, Bouchfiqa has even created new clientels of businessmen, of senators, of petty bureaucrats who are all uh, highly competing with each other. So it's difficult to uh, consider how Algeria has such an homogeneous country or such an homogeneous governing system as it was maybe uh, 15 years ago. Um, it's interesting also that to say that what allowed for the survival of the regime in 1999 uh, and throughout the 2000s uh, is the, are the policy, uh, the reconciliation policies, sorry. National reconciliation has been decided from the top again, from uh, uh, the army, even before Bouteflika went to uh, power. Uh, but the problem is that it has not been transparent and it has not been built on uh, legitimate uh, uh, foundations. There has been a public referendum and it was kind of tricky because people were asked, uh, are you uh, against or for the peace in Algeria? So obviously uh, people massively voted yes for, yes we want to reconcile with each other. But the terms of the reconciliation were much more uh, directed uh, through, uh, to, uh, in order, to, via, towards uh, the army, in order, because in order to uh, allow uh, them to survive, because by law, you cannot prosecute any member of the security services for exactions uh, done in the 90s in Algeria. Uh, people who Islamists uh, who have been in prison uh, have been pardoned, but they have not been uh, compensated for uh, their sometimes unfair imprisonment. Uh, terrorists have been uh, have benefited from. Uh, I mean, they have received money. They have been. They have got advantages, and it's quite difficult for people to face the guy who killed your brother or your mother or your sister in the same neighborhood in the name of the reconciliation. Mm. So the reconciliation may have allowed the military to survive, but it has not pacified uh, the Algerian society and it has more importantly delegitimated uh, the concept of justice, of social justice. So criminality is on the rise and people uh, in civil society do not believe that uh, the Algerian political system uh, could be, uh, may be able to uh, uh, govern in a, in, a, in, a, in a fair way. Uh, so reconciliation uh, did not solve the issue. Uh, there's also a final point I would like to make, uh, and not mentioning the dysfunctioning of anti-terrorist policies, because uh, reconciliation has obviously not erased uh, the dysfunctioning that are happening between Bouchfiqa on one hand and the secret services on the other hand. The last point I would like to make is also an argument that we often uh, hear about when talking about Algeria. Algeria has not experienced any kind of revolution because the power has uh, the, pop the capabilities to buy social peace. I would say that it's a mistaken view. When you really looked at Algeria uh, and what has changed in, in Algeria since uh, 2010 to 2011, you will see that uh, the rent does not buy so uh, social peace it actually generates more riots and more demands uh, for sharing the rent. And it's difficult to uh, say that uh, the rent, of course it has enlarged clientels of the regime. <coughs> As a famous say in Algeria, it has democratizing uh, uh, only corruption, but it has democratizing the corruption. More and more people are corrupted. <coughs> Excuse me. But I would say that the rent, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> it's, uh, 
it's a plot. <laughs> 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 the rant is not an efficient tool to buy social peace. That's a very important thing to keep in mind. The more you give, the more people demand, and the more people demand, the more dissatisfaction there is. So we really need to understand that Algeria is an interesting country to understand what happened when tools, transitional tools are blocked, when a, when a, a, a whole country is waiting for a solution without uh, paying the price of transparent negotiations. What is actually, and that's my conclusion, what is actually, actually uh, occurring in Algeria is that Social protests, uh, social dissent has not been eliminated, even if we haven't had any revolution, but it has only been uh, um, moved outside any official uh, channels for negotiations. Th same thing for uh, competition within the regime. We, s we still have an hyper presidential election, pre an hyper president in a wheelchair. But actually, we still have high uh, dissent and high competition within the regime between various clientels. And it's not because we don't see it that, it's, that it doesn't exist. And we will see what uh, Algeria uh, will hold for 2019. But I would say that mm, sidelining uh, legitimate and transparent channels for negotiations cannot produce, can produce anything uh, but stability. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will move to... Now, for a Moroccan perspective, will uh, Dr. Mati, please? Uh, thank you. <coughs> Assalamu alaikum. Uh, first, please, uh, I am sorry if about my poor English, but I will use it in a way to make myself understood by you. <laughs> no, so, uh, I will try with English, yeah, and that's fine. Uh, we will see. <laughs> <coughs> So Morocco today is one of the most uh, open uh, political uh, systems in our region. But uh, first, also, it's very easy to be the best in our region, <laughs> <laughs> given the general situation of uh, public uh, liberties and uh, democracy in the region. The situation today in Morocco shows a multi-party system uh, there is a government composed of six parties. There is also a parliament dominated by a, a party that is known historically as an opposition party, the PGD, the Adela Tanmiya. One has the impression that the press is flourishing and diverse. One has the impression also that uh, civil society, despite some problems, is active and diverse. Uh, this is the general uh, view we can have in Morocco when we are outside Morocco. But if we dig uh, deeper, we can quickly realize that uh, Morocco lives under a semi-authoritarian regime, uh, and that the situation of uh, uh, civil liberties, and human rights and the freedom of press is today is uh, the worst in a quarter of a century. Since 1994, it's the worst situation for civil liberties and also for uh, power sharing. Uh, as a historian, I can uh, mention three major events that show that prove that there is a lack of uh, political will uh, of the ruling elite regarding uh, democratic reforms and uh, power sharing. Uh, the first event was the first, the first constitutional experience in Morocco uh, from 1963 to 1965. I mean, the three events show also that when the regime, when the ruling elite is under pressure because of political or social unrest, because of the weakening for a reason or another of the official legitimacy, if you want, there is, I mean, projects of power sharing and uh, democratization, if you want. So the first experience uh, was 
during the years of 1963-1965, about two years or one year, eight months. Uh, it was uh, started because of the death uh, of Mohammed V. Do you know Mohammed V was the most popular Moroccan leader against the French, against colonialism, and but he died very young. He was 50. And uh, his uh, son, his, the crown prince, uh, was uh, relatively young. And there were leaders of the national movement very strong on the level, on the popular level, such as Mahdi Ben Barka, Alal Al Fasi, Abdurrahman Yusfi, etc., etc. And the regime weakened, uh, was weakened because of the death of Mohammed V the nationalist leader. So <clears throat> there was this first constitutional uh, reform, and it was a genuine reform. Uh, but the problem, after one year, the national movement parties, in French we say the national movement. It means the nationalist movement against the French, led by Ben Barka, by al al Fasi, etc., dominated the parliament. And it was, there was the first blockage, if you want. Do you know there was a blockage in 2017, 2016, but the first blockage in uh, Moroccan political history uh, was during these years, 64, 65, and it was a problem for the, uh, for the ruling elite. What to do? The parliament is dominated by strong parties, member of the independentist movement, led by the leaders I mentioned, and the regime had a very weak, I mean, elite, uh, members of the elite, uh, pro-regime elite inside the, the parliament, in general rural notables, illiterate, I mean, 80% of them were illiterate, and 10% of them had primary school, or a degree only. The leaders of the national movement were some, were even philosophers, intellectuals, I mean, they were in prison for uh, struggling for independence, etc., etc. And there was so the king decided a state of emergency that more or less remained until the 90s. The 90s, there was a new problem, and uh, this is the second event, if you want. Uh, it is uh, symbolized by the gouvernement d'alternance or the transitional government led by Abdurrahman Yusfi, who was at this epoch about 75. And because he had the legitimacy, so he became to help the regime to, how to say, to starja, how to recover. Recover, bring back. From uh, this uh, weakening, because there was the most important protest in the history of Morocco until today was organized in February, 1991, about 600,000 people asking the king, Hassan II, for reformers, and also for to withdraw the Moroccan army from the, the, the first, uh, the second war in the Gulf. And there was really, during one, uh, one year, the, the situation was very, very unstable. Even the, uh, the, the uh, we now now uh, we know now that uh, Spain army, for example, uh, organized I mean uh, a mobilization of the army to uh, how to say to prevent any Moroccan attack against Ceuta and Melilla because they, they 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 thought that the situation for the regime was so bad that he will try to have if you want uh, a solution by liberating, I mean, the, the Spanish enclaves in, in Morocco, etc. Et and now it is officially, uh, I mean, recognized by the Spanish, uh, I mean, studies center that is uh, under the supervision of the Spanish army. Just to give you an idea that the situation was very bad, and also what uh, made the situation in the 90s very bad for the ruling elite, that Hassan II became very sick really very, very sick since 1994. And uh, there was the, so there was the political unrest, social unrest, and the, the sickness of uh, the late Hassan II. And there was this 
government that is named the Gouvernement d'Altenance and led by a very popular leader that is uh, uh, Abdurrahman Yusufi, 94 today, 94 today. And, uh, but just after, I mean, the death of Hassan II and the ruling elite was, how to say, uh, stabilizing the situation. So one year and a half, or uh, about two years after the death of Hassan II, the situation became very good for the ruling elite and Yusufi was sacked and uh, the, the government wasn't appointed according to the majority in the parliament by, uh, it was led by a technocrat close to the palace. Mm -hmm. So this is the second event showing that there is a lack of, uh, I mean, uh, a political lack of the ruling elite uh, regarding democratization and uh, power sharing. The third event is the blockage in, 19, in 2006 and 2000, uh, 2016 and 2017. Uh, you know, there was, uh, there was in Morocco uh, protests during the, the year of the Arab Spring. It was uh, uh, relatively strong, uh, about 150 towns and uh, small uh, towns uh, and also big uh, cities uh, participated in this movement, uh, asking for democratization. And uh, I mean, the demands were mainly political demands. I mean, civil liberties, human rights, democratization. And the ruling elite couldn't try it, but couldn't to organize counter protests. So after about five months of protests, the government organized a pro-regime demonstration, demonstration, but this demonstration was organized by uh, uh, Tariq al Shia. I mean, the, a brotherhood, a traditional brotherhood, uh, financed and funded by the government, and the demonstration was really uh, weak if we compare it to the protesters, I mean, asking for democratization and uh, freedoms. Uh, so the, the, there was a very intelligent uh, reaction by the ruling elite, and there was a very good uh, constitution in uh, July 2015, and even there was a government and there was elections that were not rigged for the first time in Morocco. Elections, elections weren't rigged and they were won by an independent party that is the PGD, Al-Adala uh, Al-Tanmiya Party. Uh, and there was, uh, I mean, a government led by a former opponent to the, to the regime that is uh, Ben Kiran. But, uh, I mean, during about uh, five years, during the term, uh, Ben Kiran saw that it was impossible for him to govern, I mean, according to the, to the Constitution, because the main powers stayed between the hands, of, uh, between the same hands, if you want, and uh, was from time to time showing his uh, miscontent, we can say. Uh, vis a vis the ruling elite. Uh, but the problem, in general, the ruling elite, after three, four years, a party in the government, after three, four years, he lost any popularity because he can't govern and he can't oppose the regime. So we have not the material benefits of the government because you can't impl implement your your, uh, your program for your constituency, and in the same time, you have the moral advantage to oppose injustice, lack of democracy, human rights abuse, etc., etc. In general, it was like that. But because Ben Kiran showed, and he was very, very clever that he showed, and more or less every month he was seeing that he isn't governing, that he was only helping the king. <clears throat> and helping the ruling elite. So he, how to say, uh, saved his popularity. 
and during the 19, uh, the 2016 elections, PGD, I mean the Ben Kiran, the head of government, uh, uh, the head of government's uh, ruling party, uh, and the ruling party, if you want, ruling between quotation marks, uh, won the elections, and even he got the highest score in the history of Morocco. So it was really, Morocco entered really a very grave political crisis because the ruling elite saw that uh, this time it didn't work. And so there was the creation of a blockage, uh, how to say it in English, some kind of installment or? Blo uh, uh, blockage. Yeah, blockage. Yeah. I mean, there was no solution because uh, the ruling elite didn't help the the, the leader of the majority, Ben Kiran, to form a government. Any party was, for example, showing some will to participate in the government. He was put under pressure. And at the end, Ben Kiran couldn't form a government. But there was a solution. There was a constitutional solution that to dissolve the parliament and to organize new elections. But the ruling elite was under pressure and was, how to say, uh, Haifa, was, was uh, fearing that uh, Ben Kiran party won even more, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, votes. So they, they decide uh, an anti-constitutional decision to relieve Ben Kiran from his, uh, position. From his uh, position as head of government and nominate a government not based on the <coughs> parliamentary majority. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Harik. Um, Dr. Arabi. Okay. Um, thank you so much indeed, Adel. Um, <clears throat> thank you also to my uh, colleagues. Um, I guess really um, I'd like you know, to begin by uh, saying something about uh, the tools of analysis when uh, you are uh, faced with uh, or confronted with this huge geography you call the Maghreb. <clears throat> How do you analyze the unfolding events? Um, because that is really challenging. Dr. Arabi, you can press the mic Don't know. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's yes. better. OK, thank you. Yeah, cheers. Yeah. Um, let me repeat. Um, basically, uh, for me, like the starting point, or the departure point for, um, I guess, really uh, understanding or at least coming to grips with what's going on in North Africa is um, to understand uh, what methodology, what tools of analysis are the best for reading um, the unfolding events. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, Very excellent. Good. So um, I guess really what we have, you have on the one hand the democratization field, transitology as um, Amel um, correctly uh, mentioned. Um, and I guess really the paradigm at, at the moment is really dying. How can we utilize a dying paradigm to um, understand and read, interpret the events in, in North Africa? Because really what we see is not um, conceivably um, democratic or um, I guess really uh, on par with um, the conditions of democratization that uh, we find in other regions. And I guess really you can say, well, maybe social movements theory, but do we have really social movements in, in, in the region? Despite the fact that you've got people who are you know, at least they have the, or they have adopted uh, a purposeful um, engagement, uh, civic engagement towards uh, some kind of a change. And then on the other hand, you've got people who are, I guess, really working towards the uh, um, maintenance, uh, maintaining the uh, state quo. So really the narrative of Tunisia, I guess, really is a hodgepodge. It's like between Algeria and between Morocco. It's got elements and ingredients which you can find in the Moroccan system, and it's got other elements which you find in the Algerian system. So really, uh, what's interesting about uh, Tunisia is, uh, I guess, really the, the idea of Ibn Khaldun. Ibn Khaldun uh, has got this dichotomy or dichotomous framework. He talks about the center, and he talks about Medina al-Atraf, like the taraf, the margins. 
And I think with really Tunisia, the success story, if I know sort of people have uh, talked a lot about um, the exceptionalism of Tunisia, which really I don't subscribe to, but I guess really if we uh, go along those lines, let's say that Tunisia functions or labors with um, uh, two um, societies. Uh, one society is the one that's been centralized uh, and which has bonded with the state, or at least come into grips with bonding with the state. And then on the other hand, you've got, I guess, really a taraf, or a taraf, the margins. Um, and that, I guess, really is uh, epitomized by um, ongoing um, anomic uh, movements all over the place. So it's like the analog for al husayma is bin Girdan, and et cetera, et cetera. And I think this is really, um, in a way, a la carassière, um, a rancière, a la rancière, it's a wonderful thing for Tunisia, like to, to get a bit of chaos. It's chaos is actually the driving force uh, that's keeping everyone honest in the search for uh, creating or recreating uh, the state. Let me elaborate. So really when you go um, you know, to uh, the center, what you've got, you've got like really the people who um, have more or less uh, um, shared the slice of the cake between them through um, democratic um, electoral, uh, free and fair elections, etc. And they ended up um, within the state. Yet they have, you know, what they lack is the psychology of uh, governance. You know, they don't know how to govern yet. In, in fact, like you, can, you may say that they misgovern. And there is uh, ample evidence to Marshall to say that, you know, that's what they've been doing. So it's like um, a trial and error, which is uh, you know, so obvious that you can actually get lots of examples which we can, I guess, really uh, discuss later on. Um, so what you have at the moment, you've got basically, and this is really the anomaly, the anomaly is very interesting. So you've got like the, the, the ruling Nida, and then you've got Nahda. So the Nahda gives up its role of uh, functioning as the opposition in order to reconcile itself with the state. And that is really very interesting. Another who has historically, continuously, um, I guess really uh, built this political identity on the basis of um, opposing the state. Uh, the post-colonial state suddenly is there, uh, is empowered, has got a mandate by the people. Um, to, to represent at least like, um, let's say, uh, a fragment of the constituency in Tunisia. And yet, it uh, gives up that um, mandate. It, it, chooses, it chooses to work with the ruling party, which is NIDA, instead of opposing NIDA. And that is like really an incredible anomaly. Um, so when you talk like to Nahdawis, they say, well, this is really a, a, a democracy at Tawafuqiyya. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, we're trying, you know, sort of conciliatory democracy is like the way forward. It's, it's the only way. Um, so I guess really you fast forward from the elections of 2011, which um, gave us the uh, um, our constituent assembly. Uh, so we had really the par paraphernalia of, of the state. We ended up with a constitution, et cetera, et cetera. And now we um, have, uh, I guess, really uh, the ongoing preparation for the uh, delayed, much delayed um, municipal elections. And here there is suddenly like you've got a, a different game. A game really which, in a way, um, prompts us to ask very difficult questions about the uh, repositioning uh, you know, the power repositioning by Nida, by Nahda, etc., etc. And that is um, for these reasons. Um, Nahda suddenly is like really probably the most um, organized, the, the, the party that has gone to um, the public six months before the uh, municipal um, elections uh, preparations and uh, more or less like got itself uh, uh, represented in 350 uh, you know, uh, municipalities. It's, got, it's the only party at the moment that's got 350 lists. 
And Nidea has got similar, I think, number, but really with lots of difficulty. What they try to do is like to flirt a little bit with um, uh, independent lists and try you know, to co-opt them in order to more or less like um, even uh, to level the playing field. That's like you know, the game uh, Nide is uh, trying to do now. And then you've got like on, uh, you know, on the other side, you've got um, Al Jabha, the front, Al uh, Tayyar, democratic um, uh, current, et cetera, et cetera. All of these basically really are like, you know, uh, they're not playing uh, and will not feature much in uh, the elections. I don't expect them to, to win uh, many seats. But what's really happening here, it's like really this, it's, it's almost like reversing or let's say um, you know, committing the mistake or the sin of historical amnesia because in 1989, Nahda made the mistake of uh, bidding uh, for power by having lists all over the country in Tunisia and they paid like a huge price. And now, like you come in uh, 2018, nearly 30 years later, and you do exactly the same thing. Basically, um, flexing muscle. And you know that is really dangerous in a place like Tunisia because you've got like the left, the radical left, which is lurking you know, on the sidelines, uh, trying you know, to find any kind of, of excuse to exclude Nahda, to, to basically uh, diminish the importance of um, you know, such um, a win if Nahda, let's say, like, uh, you know, sweeps you know, the board uh, on the day of the elections <clears throat> in May. So this is really the game. The game is like uh, what we have. You have like the organizational, um, let's say, capacity, capacity building. Nahda is good. Nahda probably like, you know, features uh, first. Then you've got Nida, and then you've got the other parties. So this is really one game. This is one game, basically. Um, and I think really this game is not really about the municipal elections. It's not about the, the uh, declared and stated um, aims, which is um, decentralization, which will, be, which will take a long, long time before we arrive at decentralization, um, simply because, um, I guess, really the juridical, legal um, <clears throat> systems for entrenching uh, decentralization are not actually in place. And then what you've got there, you've got at Taraf, you've got the margins, you've got really people who are more or less keeping the state and politicians um, honest, and that is like the anomic side of politics in Tunisia. And Tunisia really like, you know, this is really important, this is like something, you know, to, to uh, remember, that Tunisia has probably persevered um, on the path of, you know, Karl Marx has got like, you know, a nice term. He, he, he talks about the fetishism of commodities. And I guess really in Tunisia what you've got, you've got like, you know, the fetishism of elections. Really, you've got like this fetishism of, of elections. So really what you have, you have at Taraf, the protest movement, which in a way, um, I think really it, it um, denudes the, the uh, Tunisian system, the Tunisian political system, because it has not been able so far to um, recruit uh, strongly from the youth movement. So really the youth, instead actually of, of, of playing politics formally at the formal level, um, they prefer the margins. And that is likely a big question why the youth, and I don't really know whether this question actually applies you know, to Algeria and Morocco, why the youth in Tunisia, maybe that has got implications for Algeria and Morocco, choose the informal over the formal? And what are actually the implications uh, of that for stability, for democratization, for a distributive justice, etc. Et All of these are really important questions you know, um, in, in the uh, Tunisian case. Um, I don't really want like, you know, to, to go on about this, but basically for me, this is like you know, the space you know, to be uh, watched and stay tuned for more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So it, it seems to me that uh, there are a number of uh, similarities here. Uh, seven years after uh, the uprisings, uh, we have much of the similar issues that we're currently dealing with uh, in Morocco, uh, there's been protests, ongoing protests in, 
uh, in the Reef region and in Jarada, uh, in Tunis, uh, we have the fish and stand now movement. Uh, and even in Algeria, currently, there are uh, public sector protests, uh, teachers and other public sectors work. So it seems to me that much of these economic conditions still persist and governments are scrambling to deal with them. Why have they not been successful? Uh, what, what is the way forward? Uh, I mean, I am speaking uh, only about uh, Morocco. I mean, uh, about the social unrest, uh, it seems to me it's like of uh, an Arab Spring uh, in puzzle. I mean, with the, it's uh, the social Arab Spring, if you want, mm -hmm. because in Morocco in 2011, the demands were mainly political, and they were led and organized by the politicized sector of the population, mainly the youth, but not only the youth. I mean, there was demonstrators, even, uh, for example, Shabi, who was the, the how to say, the, 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 the greatest billionaire in Morocco, participated. Shabi, he was the, how to say, the leading billionaire in the Maghreb, okay. according to Forbes. Okay. But he was punished. He lost 80% of his fortune in the following years and became, he is now under 1 billion. Just to give you an idea, so it was man. the protests were really dominated by political demands. And more or less it was, uh, how to say, a fa failure, mm -hmm. I mean, for, for these people who initiated the movement. Uh, because also, I mean, the government uh, did not respond the political, uh, I mean, the ruling elite did not respond the demands about uh, human rights, respect, about uh, democratization, about uh, enlargement of the civil liberties, etc., etc. So now we have a, some kind of social Arab Spring led by a small, uh, I mean, in number, a small elite by politicized youth but the majority of demonstrations are not politicized. They are just asking for social and economic rights. And in general, these demands are very linked to their daily life. Because of that, it's local. It's in Jarada, I mean, in uh, Oriental Morocco, it's in, uh, in, uh, in Al Husseima, in the in northern part of Morocco, in Autat al Hajj, in Oriental Morocco, in Zagora, in the southern part of Morocco, it's Al Atraf. Mm -hmm. Because why Al-Atraf, why the margins of Morocco? Because it is there where there is really poverty, according to the official uh, figures. I mean, the northern part of Morocco, the oriental uh, region are really very poor, and the income of, uh, of uh, about 30% of the families is under $3 a day. Mm -hmm. The family, not a person. So the situation in some cases in some regions is very, very, uh, it's very uh, dire. dire. It's very bad if you want. But you have also the unemployment, the unemployed people who has, who, who have uh, university degrees and they are unemployed. So after four, three, five years in university, they got back to their regions. Mm -hmm. They have no work, but they are politicized. So they, and they can only organize on the local level. So they, they, they did that because you have, I mean, the political police, etc. It made it in the last years impossible to organize on the national level because <coughs> you have the leaders, they are known, they are under pressure, or they are co-opted. About half, half. Okay. One half co-opted and one half uh, under okay. pressure. <laughs> so it's uh, easier if you want to organize on the local level uh, region because there is less political uh, police mm -hmm. and there is uh, people also know each other mm -hmm. and you have the trust between uh, people and they can organize. Of course. And there's lots of similarities with this of course with Tunisia in terms of the socio-economic mar marginalization especially on the periphery and the closeness to, to the border. I was struck uh, Dr. Arabi by a comment that you made like the preferring the informal to the formal. And this also not only applies to politics, but also in, in economics. And I understand uh, very similar to other areas of the Arab world that the informal economy in Tunisia is huge and the government has been actually trying to work very hard to bring, to formalize the informal economy. 
And even in a way, the Arab uprising protest started as a protest against the inclusion of Bouazizi and the push to put him in the uh, formal economy. So I was wondering, uh, what are the efforts that the government is trying to do to bring in the formal, to, uh, informal economy? And how come people are still resisting, even though Tunisia, I know you don't like this uh, designation, but is the, uh, reasonably the success story so far? Adil, that's really a thesis, but thank you for <laughs> raising it. Um, I think really what's happening is the securitization, like this really the answer, to securitize, um, I guess really the, the informal, um, you know, polity. Um, for instance, like when you look at the, the margins, like, you know, as, as uh, you know, our learned friend said here about Morocco, you've got all of these towns, you know, on the margins. Uh, so now you're sending the army. You're sending the army, for instance, you know, to um, uh, stop, say, contraband uh, trafficking, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And basically, uh, you've got like a primordial um, element as well, because the informal economy is really tied also to tribes and asher clans, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I guess really uh, securitization, well, I, I mean, for a long time, um, this, this taraf or margin functioned um, without being, um, I guess, really uh, viewed on the radar or by the radar of the state, you know, off the radar. It's been off the radar of the state. And suddenly it's, it's there simply because um, the state is not really worried about actually the informal economy or the black market or whatever. It's really uh, worried about one element in that, um, I guess, really informal economy, and that is the transfer or the entry of weapons from Libya to Tunisia through these transit points, which now really are uh, multiply, you know, multiplying all over uh, Tunisia. Um, so the, the obvious answer under the current government is to send in the army to try you know, to manage you know, these, uh, you know, this, this space, you know, this mm -hmm. um, informal uh, economy. I guess really what we can say about um, North Africa, as you know, like Jacques Burke you know, in his book about, um, I think it's, it's called uh, L'Intérieur du, du Maghreb, or Interior du Maghreb, Inside uh, du Maghreb. Um, you know, came up with, with this, um, I guess, really nice uh, formula. He said, look, um, you guys have to study the Maghreb always through the, uh, um, uh, well, it is like the colonial prism. How can we understand the colonial, because really, the colon, when they left, they left basically this terrain, this, this uh, let's say, unruly terrain. Mm -hmm. This unruly terrain has been able to reproduce itself through this kind you know, of activities, you know, the, the informal. The informal is really so, so important. The hinterland, you know, you know, in the language of Ibn Khaldun, it's like, you know, the mahal. So him, uh, to go back to Burke, he said, look, you cannot oppose the colonial, but you can transcend it. So what he's really asking is asking, you know, for a symmetrical uh, method of analysis, whereby you prolong the, the colonial prism, but you include in it, uh, I guess, really the post-colonial uh, prism so that you can see, you know, these kind of dynamics which, in a way, have escaped the state. Like, the state really is not, in a way, worried about what the clans or the tribes, you know, are doing or the margins, unless, unless it becomes likely really a question of raison d'etat, you know, sort of raison d'etre, you know, when the state is threatened, that's really when it becomes actually an issue for social scientists, for academics, for politicians, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But at the moment, really, even that is not really, uh, I guess, really, uh, the modus operandi. At the moment, the modus operandi is to send the army. Uh, it's it's um, almost like one-size-fits-all type uh, solution. Uh, and I think it's really, um, you know, it's, it's creating a boomerang effect. It's basically backfiring because to securitize, you know, a domain like that, you're actually creating uh, potentially um, enemies and maybe potential radicalized elements in society, you know, which will complicate, you know, the situation the of transformation, democratization, et cetera, et cetera. That's how I see it. I think securitization is, is really a big problem, you a know, big problem. for these states. Yeah. I think this also has uh, echoes of, of Algeria, I think, in the informal versus the formal. Definitely. Um, first, I would say that uh, being on the informal side is a situation that is imposed upon the people. It's not a chosen one. Uh, 
the power has chosen to put people to sideline uh, people. And uh, for the majority of the people, there's a kind of deal, a shared impunity deal. Uh, do what you want, steal what you want. We will close our eyes on, uh, on what you want. You, there won't be any uh, accountability demand. But then close your eyes on what we are doing and let us uh, do what we want in our daily lives and informal mm. markets and so on. That's for the majority of the people. I mean, after the, the failure or, or the end of the big uh, populist discourse, such as the nationalist or the Islamist ones, there's really no place anymore for the Arab people in the Arab world. I mean, so uh, what we can see, and that's also maybe a way to explain uh, mm -hmm. the multiplication of, of protests. And if you look at these street mm -hmm. protests, they are carried mm -hmm. by individuals who want to, or, or, or corporations or people who are, want to talk about their daily problems. They don't want to be uh, uh, to embed their discourse or their actions in huge ideological uh, discourses or, or traditions. Uh, if I take the example of Algeria, you have three kinds of uh, street protests for, I mean, in Algeria you have uh, around 10,000 protests a year. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are not talking about, that's not uh, an addict, anecdotal here. Mm -hmm. um, I w you, you mentioned public sector, that's an important one. Uh, doctors, teachers who are uh, asking for better work conditions, uh, salary rise and so on, but more importantly for autonomous representations. Political representativeness uh, from a fake uh, pluralist uh, and fake elected uh, uh, governance systems is an important issue. Mm. So these unions, because they are mainly work, workers' unions, are, are, are really uh, trying to find their way uh, outside of uh, Sham's uh, civil society that the governments in the three countries have been uh, building for, for the past 50 years or 40 years. So uh, unions, uh, public unions are trying to uh, uh, reach uh, autonomous uh, political representation. You also have young unemployed. I think mm. we can find these kind of structures and organizations in three countries mm. who are trying to talk about their, who are um, providing on social networks mainly, um, but also um, mm. uh, during um, small demonstrations local ones, uh, trying to talk about, uh, to, to have personal testimonies of injustice. Mm. And this is a way to reclaim your quality of citizen. Because going to vote, in a, as I said before, in elections that are so uh, deeply controlled from the top, mm. uh, playing the role of the fake citizen is not a way to be uh, active. But being on the margins and, and, mm. and telling about the fact that the difficulty that you have to find a, a job because of corruption and a lot of other things is a way to reclaim your quality uh, uh, of, of a citizen. Um, and there's a third uh, category of protest. Uh, and again, we can find it in the three countries. It's about social, basic social protests, uh, asking mm. for houses, uh, electricity, uh, and uh, it's uh, also in the three countries a way to bypass uh, their, mar their marginalization, the marginalization of simple, the mm. average daily people uh, from uh, rent hire and clientelistic circles. I mean, not everyone benefits from the rent and, the, and, and clientelistic redistribution in, in, the, in these three countries. So going to the streets, as I mentioned in my, in my presentation, and hurling the state, hey, the state, where are you? I mean, uh, stop uh, hiding behind the election. Where is the deep state? Hey, the deep state, I'm on the streets and I'm asking for my piece of the cake. Mm -hmm. And this is why I say that um, these demonstrations much more, in my sense, a way to negotiate with the real power than uh, 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 willing to, willing, uh, trying to get rid of the regime. Thank you. I mean, we've covered, uh, I think, the, the people uh, but I think we, we should ask a question about the, the state itself and the nature of the state uh, and what is also known as the deep uh, state in each of the countries. Uh, in Morocco, known as the Mahzen, in Algeria, known as the Pouvoir, and of course in Tunisia, there, it doesn't have a specific name, but there's an old boys network uh, operating there as well from the Ben Ali uh, days who were able to survive the transition. So I was wondering, uh, these uh, old elites, 
how have they adapted? I mean, it seems like the political environment opened up and they were able to, for example, co-opt the Islamists in the system. Has there been a realignment of the political uh, environment uh, for this uh, deep state? Yes, uh, in Morocco, it was clear that uh, since 2011, the deep state changed uh, I mean, its, how to say, uh, approach to the opposition and uh, tried, uh, in one hand, uh, to copt it. Even uh, the local uh, I mean, leaders of the opposition, Islamist or uh, pro-democratic opposition or any way, or any other, uh, or whatever, I mean, ideological uh, position, they try to cope with them even on the local level. For example, to push them to win elections, uh, to push them to create uh, association or social groups, uh, and uh, to receive, I mean, uh, public money to, to develop the place or I mean, to help uh, poor women to have uh, an income, etc., etc. And also on the central level, I mean, the deep state uh, copted, I mean, a good part of the former opposition in the, in the government, but also uh, in the administration and also in uh, national councils for education, for human rights, for uh, regional development and whatever, I mean. Uh, also on the, how to say, on the popular level, the deep state turn a blind uh, eye on the illegal, if you want, economic activities in order to, to make pressure of the state, uh, I mean, uh, less, how to say, less, uh, uh, less firm, less, uh, less strong than before. For That's example, uh, even in Morocco, uh, some intellectuals uh, named the, mer uh, the ambulant merchants Bouaziziyin. Mm -hmm. It means uh, named after Bouazizi, the Tunisian guy who, who uh, I mean, uh, uh, who went to, who went to heaven, uh, emulated himself. Yes. So, Nas uh, Arabat how to, to say it in English? Uh, the ambulant merchant, small yeah. ambulant merchant who are, who, who are I mean, uh, making life from informal, informal activities. Informal economy. Yeah. Yes, they, they, they can, even in the central part of the capital of Morocco, Rabat, in the night, in the night you have this, I mean, informal merchant who are in general. Uh, getting uh, food or uh, or uh, clothes, etc., from uh, the Spanish enclaves because it's less expensive, okay. and uh, selling them in Rabat, in Casablanca, in Marrakech, etc., etc. Why during the night? Because the formal uh, merchant and the formal traders who pay taxes protest mm -hmm. in the days and call the police to, to sweep them out their uh, area. Mm -hmm. But in the night, they can do that until 1 a.m. Okay. They, they can work. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I think we're running out of time, so we want to get some questions from the audience. Uh, so before we uh, start, I have a question. Sorry to use my prerogative. Uh, a bit of international relations. So let's move away from the socioeconomic. As you know, there's a Gulf crisis uh, unfolding uh, around us in the region. I'm very curious to see, to, to hear your opinion on how each of the Maghreb countries has been able to navigate this inter-Arab uh, discourse and conflict. Professor Arbus, start. Thank you. Um, um, <clears throat> as you know, Tunisia is, is uh, the foreign policy of, of Tunisia is not to have a foreign policy. They don't have one. It's, it's, it's risk aversion. I guess it is emblematic of how Tunisia behaves uh, internationally. So I try as really, you know, to um, more or less uh, walk a tightrope, uh, be friends with everyone. Uh, but really what you see is fragmentation within polities. So you've got 
uh, partially uh, people aligning themselves, you know, with UAE because, as you know, like, you know, th there is this new phenomenon in North Africa, uh, specifically Tunisia, the uh, transfer of huge uh, funds uh, to Investments. certain politicians and political parties without mentioning anyone. Um, and on the other hand, you've got also like, you know, uh, I guess really the Islamists and the state itself who has maintained really um, close relations with Qatar. Qatar has been a very generous donor. I think it is one country that really, uh, in a way, has worked so hard to stabilize uh, this process, you know, transformation, democratization, etc., etc. So you've seen like Tunisia has not, like in its declaratory policy, has not actually said anything bad against anything, despite the fact that there was a hitch, you know, in the relations, you know, between uh, Tunisia and UAE, which was actually triggered, you know, by, uh, I guess, I don't know, what was described as some kind of misunderstanding over whether women board, you know, uh, planes or whatever. But basically, it's really, uh, you know, um, politics as usual. As usual. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't agree with my friend uh, Larbi, even if he is Tunisian and he, is, uh, he knows Tunisia more than me. Yes, under Sebsi, yes, but not under Marzouki, uh, President Marzouki. Uh, President Marzouki was even too much, uh, I mean, courageous because Tunisia is a small country and he took positions, I mean, sometimes very tough positions against some dictators uh, in, in the Arab world, for example, against. Uh, the bloody regime in Syria, but also he criticized before the assembly, the general assembly of the United Nations, the coup in Egypt, and what is bizarre, and what it showed that there was really a Tunisian diplomacy that the Emirates, not Egypt, uh, withdrew his ambassador, its ambassador from Tunisia, not Egypt. He was criticizing the coup in Egypt and Emirates, how to say cut 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 off relations cut off the diplomatic relations with the Tunis so it was uh, really very uh, a very important I mean step by uh, President Marzouki for the first time in the Arab world there was a pro democracy diplomacy in the region Amal? well uh, Algeria is a non uh, interventionist uh, country by nature, I mean, it's linked to its uh, post-colonial uh, history. We do not uh, want to give lessons to certain uh, countries and we respect their sovereignty, so it's not quite, uh, I mean, it's, it's a quite normal that Algeria has not uh, taken sides. But I believe that there's also, I'm always blaming the, the government of the, the, or the governing elite of the three countries, so I, I will be the devil advocate for once. I believe that also the three countries have been reduced to what really the Europe and the US have been uh, uh, tailored uh, for them for the past 20 years, which are anti-migration and anti-terrorist policies. So it's difficult to have these countries now taking size or having a clear position on Arab affairs. I mean, we, these three countries are not taking position on Arab affairs for the past, have not taken, uh, taken uh, positions on Arab affairs for the past uh, 20 years. Uh, so even uh, intra-negotiations, the Arab Maghreb Union is still something to, that uh, we are, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it has not materialized. Mater okay. materialized. So uh, yeah, the capac capabilities of negotiation at an international level is quite weak. Okay. Thank you. Okay, well, just to go out, I think I'm noticing the time. Let's have some questions from the audience. Uh, we have here the gentleman here, please, in the center here. We'll take a couple of questions, and then we'll uh, go to our panel. Thank you. Uh, regarding the first uh, speaker, Amal Abubakar, Algeria, I think the blockage uh, in Algeria didn't start with the fourth mandate of uh, Bouteflika, or maybe the five or the six, but it's uh, something uh, more... Uh, do you know that uh, the first day of the um, independence of Algeria, there is, there is a big conflict between l'armée des frontières et ceux de l'intérieur. It means that after six decades of the independence of Algeria, always the internal conflict in the system is reproducing. 
Uh, maybe when the Algerian population was less than 20 million, it was less to, uh, to manage this uh, population, even if the, the price of the oil or the gas was uh, less than uh, 10. And now it's more complicated, but I am not so sure that what you mentioned is really through regarding Algeria, that this deal between uh, le gouvernant et le gouverné, uh, this is the strategy also uh, sorry, women so didn't do it before. What's, what's uh, the question, sorry? Uh, my question is not so new as it was presented. It's something, and here I join uh, the, uh, the Moroccan, uh, that it's linked with the history. And, uh, uh, to finish, uh, before the independence of Algeria, do you know that uh, the, the Bambarka, uh, Bourguiba, and other uh, Algerian elite was in the same, uh, uh, l'Association des étudiants Maghrébins en France, l'Association des étudiants nord africains en France. It means that we, ha we are here in the same generation Thank you. of politicians. If you listen carefully uh, uh, what uh, uh, Burji, uh, Egyptian, uh, uh, Tunisian uh, uh, presented now, uh, describe Algeria, we feel that we are uh, in the second year of the independence of, of Algeria okay. and the Tunisia. This, I think <laughs> that you. we cannot reduce Just to our analysis only is what is happening. Uh, Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. We'll take a couple more questions. Ranj? Okay, very good. In the back. Question back there. Yes, please, sir. Mohammed Yasin Najjar in Syria. I have a number of questions for each and every panelist. The first question. Is it possible for Tunisia to withdraw, uh, sorry, to uh, go back to dictatorship? As for Algeria, you have seen Al Jazeera a decade ago, and I have really I've been really surprised to the level of underdevelopment when it comes to the economy, knowing that Algeria has human capital and also has oil. So why wasn't Algeria able to develop and advance? As for Morocco, is there any hope for Morocco to transfer into a constitutional monarchy? So this situation in which it stands uh, between a number of powers that are given to the political parties, is this the situation? Situation that is going to continue. The last question is the relationship between the countries of North Africa. I have uh, found that we have not shed light on this matter. There is a problem when it comes between uh, a problem between the relationship uh, between both uh, Algeria and Morocco. And then, who so uh, I can try to not to answer, but to, to make some comments after the question of my friend from uh, Syria. If it is possible in the future that Morocco uh, can take the road uh, in, uh, to a, a true parliamentary uh, monarchy. I mean, in the constitution, it is said that Morocco is, is a constitutional, democratic, social, and parliamentary uh, uh, monarchy. But I mean, on the the, the problem is uh, on the level of implementation. Uh, up until now, I mean, the ruling elite is not the elected elite. It is another elite that developed inside the country, uh, inside the regime during the last uh, three centuries, if you want. And uh, the problem now is if there is, I mean, there is a social development, uh, the education, for example, is more and more larger. I mean, uh, larger uh, sectors of the population are more and more uh, educated in uh, school, sometimes at the university. And there is, I mean, uh, political demands asking for uh, a parliamentary monarchy. Uh, I think in 10, 20 years, we can have it because uh, the Moroccan monarchy has the main thing in the Moroccan mar monarchy politics is the uh, survival instinct. 
and this monarchy want to survive even in the cadre of a parliamentary monarchy. Okay. Thank you. Amal? Yes, on the first question, I agree with you, the lack of project of society uh, actually and the lack of an agreement, a, a, a large democratic agreement on what Algeria uh, should like uh, actually starts right after 62. And uh, since then, Algerians, leaders and the people are still looking forward, uh, are still looking towards a way to live together, uh, a specific, uh, for example, uh, uh, rules on the role of religion in public life, on the role of women, and so on and so on. Now, what has changed is that Algeria is a post-crisis country. What has changed is that the, there's the, the, the total, almost total disappearance of the revolutionary legitimacy, which is something so important in Algeria until recently. You have now in Algeria a post-terrorism generation, as they call themselves, who have not, who they born in the early 2000s, and they really do not care about the army, about uh, France, about uh, uh, the way uh, Algeria has been built after, after the independency. And they are really looking f to um, find solutions, as I said, for their daily own problems. And their culture is so different, that politi their political culture is so different from the Ben Bella and the Ben Barka and the others that you were mentioning. I mean, they, they, it's a joke, it's some, somehow tragic, but for a country who puts su such a strong focus on the revolutionary legitimacy, go now in Algeria and ask young people about, uh, to, give, uh, to, to give you three names about revolutionary heroes. They will find great difficulties to do so. So I, I really believe that, yes, uh, there are uh, ongoing problems, especially on the rules and what it means to be an Algerian and what it means and how can we can live together as, an, as Algerian people. But still, there's a new generation that is totally disconnected from the old debates, especially the post-colonial debates. On economic democratization, well, you know, the situation, corruption is endemic and uh, it's a, a, a souk, a bazaar economy, as uh, Algerian economists have has called it, uh, that is not uh, uh, built on, 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 on real market. Now, uh, thanks to rising oil prices throughout since the, 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 the early 2000s, there has been the emergence of a middle class. And, uh, and, but there's no real political exit for this middle class. So, and, and of course, uh, a political uh, willingness to modernize the country should be the lead to modernize the economy. And uh, I would say, but maybe uh, as a joke again, uh, fertility rate is on the rise <laughs> in Algeria. So ma even if there's no economic uh, democratization right now, people feel more at ease uh, as middle class and they, they, and they have benefited also from a lot of uh, sponsored and subsidized uh, houses in Algeria that gave them some uh, or at least a chance or a, a hope to uh, do better. But at a top level, there's still no real willingness or a real plan, a real project to democratize or to modernize Algerian economics. Thank you for the question. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very uh, <clears throat> challenging question about reversibility. Uh, comparatively speaking, we know that uh, in transitions in Brazil, Salvador, Argentina, uh, it's very much possible that you know um, a regime uh, basically backtracks and go back you know, to a position, goes back to a position of, of uh, reversibility. In the case of Tunisia, I must say this: um, there will never be a return of a quasi Ben Ali uh, regime. That will never happen at all, definitely. Uh, f for these reasons. First of all, um, I, I think we, uh, there are guarantors in the built within the Tunisian system. The Tunisian system is almost like really, uh, let's say, um, bicameral, you know, if you can think, you know, of two uh, chambers. So what you've got, you've got like, you know, the, the formal 
institutionalized you know, state with its like legal, juridical, uh, paraphernalia, infrastructure. And then what you've got, you've got like you know, the non-state institutions which are really important. They wield lots of power. Uh, they're very much part you know, of this game of, of you know, as Laswell uh, named it, who gets what, how, and, and, and why. Um, especially the syndicalist movement, so it's one of the guarantors. You know, it's got muscle, it can actually uh, mobilize, um, it can oppose the state, <coughs> etc. Et You've got like, you know, the, the women's movement is very, very powerful, it's uh, vociferous about human rights, about equality, etc., etc. At the moment, you know, it's leading an incredible campaign um, about parity, not only electoral parity, but also in, uh, of inheritance, etc., uh, etc. Et and you've got really like you know, this anomic side in, in Tunisia. Tunisia is bubbling below the state, you know, because really you cannot um, gauge this just like of, of, you know, by uh, looking at what happens at the level of the state. It's also really um, by what happens below the state. And below the state, um, I guess really in Arabic, if I can uh, you know, respond, um, it's a remarkable people. Um, for me, I rely on them. I think really sort of like if you are looking you know, for guarantees of why Tunisia would not reverse, you look really at the Tunisian people. They're really keeping the state honest. The others, as I said you know, before, they're really engaging all, you know, in all kinds of politics, but they're really politics about slicing the cake, you know, to go back to the statement by Laswell, who gets what, how, why, you know, et cetera, et cetera. At the moment, the game right now is about actually the presidential elections, and you will see those you know, who emerge from the municipal elections um, you know, as uh, you know, the triumphant sides uh, are actually bidding you know, for uh, you know, presidential uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I guess really power. That's what it is about, you know, the municipal elections. So no, it, I think Tunisia has transcended that threshold of, of authoritarianism. True that at the level of the infrastructure of the state, you know, of, of power, you've got the authoritarian bureaucratic system is still there. You know, that's really why, like, in a way, like, you know, when you go back, you know, to the prism of, uh, you know, Burke, you know, when he says, look, you know, you've got, like, to look also at, you know, the post-colonial, um, you know, side of, of, of power to understand uh, reconfiguration of power, who gets what, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's, it's, I think, really, Tunisia, we can safely assume, of course, like, no one can guarantee that would not happen. Um, it's got Buckley's, you know, to utilize an Australian uh, phrase, um, <laughs> you know, on one front, and that is like the economy, um, you know, if that is really one thing Thank Tunisia has to pay attention to. Um, true, like it's the dividends, you know, from, um, I guess, really European aid, etc. Qatar, you know, as, as I said before, is a generous, whatever. But you've got really to recreate, you know, the means of, of uh, production. Um, you've got like the uh, brain drain in Tunisia, like in the past two years, 90,000 youth, you know, educated youth um, left Tunisia. That is very, very risky. If you want like, you know, to build an intelligent society, you know, to, to, you know, to be the, I guess, really the father of democracy in, in uh, I guess, really in the language of St uh, Stuart Mill, you need an intelligent you know, society you know, to, to mobilize for the purpose of democracy. You need to retain your, your youth. The youth is leaving. You know, willingly or unwillingly, or by all means, you know, the both peoples, you know, of the world are basically North Africans today. You know, Egyptians, Libyans, you know, Algerians, Moroccans, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I think, yeah, we have transcended a threshold. I think, really, of, of you know, of, of democracy building, democracy learning. It's an apprenticeship. It's a workshop. It's work, you know, sort of end away. Um, we are hopeful. Um, we'll see. You know, what to, what uh, a fantastic uh, note to end on. A bit of hope. Always <laughs> get some hope from Dr. Uh, Arabi. Uh, it was a real pleasure uh, for this uh, event and I think lots of the discussion was, was very rich and perhaps we'll have a follow-up event uh, at a later stage. Can you please join me in thanking our panelists <laughs> for this fantastic event. Uh, before we leave, I just want to highlight we have an event coming up next week. Uh, uh, one of our visiting fellows, uh, Professor Beverly Milton Edwards, has her book launch on the 21st. 
uh, so you will get an email uh, about that. In the meantime, thank you very much for, for joining us this evening. Thank you.